in Matthew 15 that Jesus came to only the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He told the disciples, do not go into the way of the Gentiles, for salvation is of the Jews. So when he came, he came to fulfill the promises that were given to the fathers and to fulfill that. His whole first advent ministry was to fulfill the promise to the fathers, Romans 15, verse 8. So in view of that, we have to see the context of his mission to Israel. Now, if we turn to Acts chapter 2, he says, You men of Israel, and all those who have gathered there from all over the Roman world, I think Josephus said that on that feast day there could have been upwards of two million pilgrims in Jerusalem. It would just been full of people. He spoke to those who were Jews and those who were proselytes from all those various nations. And this was on a Jewish feast day. It was not the fact that they're all gathered there to celebrate this second aspect of the three main Jewish feast days, but the fact that Peter is standing up there proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah. This is spoiling everything. He is the first fruits of resurrection, and Pentecost is a first fruits feast, and so this is causing big problems. So the church that actually began at Pentecost, in terms of the disciples' understanding of what we now know, they didn't know anything at all, hardly. Jesus just says, you wait in Jerusalem until you're clothed with power from on high. So from their perspective, they are now clothed with power from on high and boldly proclaiming Christ. Do they have a consciousness that we have now, or that they had later, that they are actually living members of the Messiah? They did not. That was progressive, and that was gradually more and more defined as history went on. So, as history went on, we see various epistles written. And I mentioned the last broadcast, First and Second Thessalonians were Paul's earliest epistles, that Romans was the last epistle that Paul wrote before he went to prison. And then we begin to talk a little bit about Romans. When you get to the end of the book of Romans, we have a kind of an amazing little paragraph that is at the very end. It is placed at the end of Romans 16, verses 25 to 27. Probably most likely the very first part of Romans that was written was written before Paul went to Rome. And that probably concluded in Romans 15, verse 33 where he says in Romans 15:33, Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Well, we know that he got arrested. He went to Rome. And most likely, we don't know for sure, but Romans 16, verses 1 to 24, was then that message of Romans directed to the house churches in Rome. And then he hasn't gotten the full revelation that he refers to in Ephesians. And so he concludes this section, Romans 16.24, Some manuscripts have, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now we have Romans 16.25-27, which in the original manuscripts, in some places they try to tag it on, I believe on the end of chapter 14, some they try to put it at the end of chapter 15, but those who bring together all the various manuscripts so we can have a Bible, they finally put Romans 16.25-27 at the end of Romans 16. The whole point I'm making is that this portion of Romans was obviously added later. When we look at the content of what Paul says in his postscript, it lines up perfectly with what he received from the Lord in Ephesians 3, 1 through 11. And so we will look at this passage in Romans, and we will see how it corresponds to that revelation that Paul received when he was in prison. So Romans 16 says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel, and or even the preaching, that is the proclamation of Jesus Christ, notice, according to the revelation of the mystery. The little word according there means according to the Norman standard. This is now God's Norman standard. From that point on to the end of this dispensation. According to means this is it. I govern and judge everything as central to this theme, according to the unveiling, the revelation of the mystery, to translate that from the original, the sacred secret, which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested by the scriptures of the prophets, or another way to read that, according to the prophetic scriptures, meaning that the New Testament revelation that God gave to the apostles make up the prophetic scriptures, 
according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to the obedience of faith. To the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. So that's his third amen. He said amen at the end of chapter 15. In verse 24, which is in some manuscripts, he said amen. And this is his final amen, which is his postscript. Now, why was that put in Romans? Well, Romans is the last epistle that Paul wrote before he went to prison. And it's not written to a church. It's written to the saints in Rome. Because in Rome, if you look at chapter 16, there are at least five different assemblies there. Okay? So this is to the saints. So we have this revelation that's put on the end, and it's like a bridge. If we as believers learn all the lessons that the Corinthians didn't learn when Paul wrote First and Second Corinthians, or if we as believers didn't really learn this message of the uniqueness of the church and God's calling, that we live by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, not by the law, that's the book of Galatians, then we could move from Romans right into Ephesians. So this is like a bridge that having assimilated or been grounded in the foundations of the gospel, we can now move to the capstone. That is, that which defines God's full thought and eternal purpose for his church. Okay? So we notice the language that's in this section of Romans, or this postscript of Romans. It leads us directly to what we have in Ephesians. So if we turn to Ephesians we see a statement that Paul makes in Ephesians chapter 3. He begins this way, for this reason. All right? Now, when he says for this reason, what is he referring to? He's referring back to everything that he said, beginning with chapter 1. Well, I'll read these first four verses, and then we will go back and we will see something of the content of this reason. So Paul says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. Now, he was a prisoner of Rome, and he was under the jurisdiction of Caesar. So if Paul didn't understand God's purpose for being in prison, and he was all depressed because here he is, very busy planting churches, traveling throughout the Roman world, and then he gets arrested and put into prison. He opens his mouth before Agrippa, and he makes his appeal to Caesar. If he hadn't made his appeal to Caesar, he wouldn't be in prison, or he would have been killed by the Jews. And so here he is in prison, two years in Caesarea Philippi, and now two years in Rome. He doesn't say he's a prisoner of Caesar. He says he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. If indeed you have heard, because we saw in Romans 16, that the revelation of the mystery of Christ is for the sake of you Gentiles. So he says it again here. So that links us back to that transitional postscript in Romans 16, 25 through 27. He says it's for the sake of you Gentiles. I'm in prison. If indeed you have heard of the stewardship, that is, I'm a steward in God's household, and God is my master, and I'm responsible to dispense the wealth of the master. He has put me in charge of dispensing the master's plan, a stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in grief. Well, where did he write before in brief? The end of Romans, but also in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. He mentions the mystery there, the mystery of his will. So he says, I wrote before a brief, and by referring to this, that is, the revelation made known to me, namely the mystery, verse 4, and by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of the Christ. The mystery of the Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Be specific that the Gentiles are now joint heirs, fellow members of the body, Christ the head, and of fellow partakers, that is, called to share in the inheritance of Christ of that promise through the gospel, of which I was made a minister. So he is writing to the church, and he says, I'm in prison because of this mystery. In other words, God set me aside for my busy schedule in order that that which I began to understand in right in the other epistles, it was a growing understanding. But now that he's in prison, he's been shut in by Nero, God just opens up heaven, and he reveals to Paul his eternal 
heart secret as it pertains to the church. Now, for this reason I Paul a prisoner. So we've got to go back and say, well, what reason are you referring to, Paul? Well, if you go back to Ephesians chapter 1, we see there in that chapter, chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, in the original language, which is the Greek language, it's one long sentence. Some have said it's the longest sentence in all of world literature. If you were to look at all the different books written in history, you would not find a sentence this long. So in chapter 1 of Ephesians, verses 3 through 14, it's one sentence. So what does that say? Well, it sounds to me like a man who has seen such a vast vision of Christ in relation to his church. It is so immense in its ramifications and in its dimensions that he can't find a place to stop. He has a hard time finding a period. So if someone were to ask you or anyone listening, what is the mystery of Christ? Could you go on and on and on like Paul did in chapter 1, verses 3 through 14? Or would we say, let's see, the mystery of Christ is that God is now saving Gentiles. That's what many people will say. But that's not a mystery. We see in Romans 15, he quotes Old Testament passages in Romans 15 that make it very clear that it was God's plan to save Gentiles. That's no mystery. We see in the book of Isaiah that God has planned to save Gentiles once Israel is installed at the head of the nations. And so that's no mystery. The mystery is that there would be taken out from among the Gentiles, both Jews and Greek, to make up the body of Messiah. Or as it says in Acts chapter 15, a core part of this understanding of the mystery of Christ, which is to govern our whole thinking about God's plan for this time in history. James, I believe it is, speaking to the meeting, the council there in Jerusalem, he says in Acts 15, 14, speaking to the elders there, Acts 15, verse 14, Simon has related how God first visited or concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. Notice how God first concerned himself. What does that mean first? I mean Israel is not first? Not now, because as a nation they rejected their Messiah. And so we see in Ephesians the beginning of that which defines the period of history which we now live and the church in the context of that period of history, which is central to God's eternal purpose. Now, in chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, or literally the one having blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place in Christ, just as he chose us in him, notice, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Now you see that little phrase, before. Before the foundation of the world, that means before the creation of the universe. So the mystery has to do with the plan in God's heart before there ever was the creation of the universe. Okay. Now what about Israel and the nations? How do we understand the framework of God's purpose and plan for Israel and the nations when he returns at the second coming? Well, if you look at Matthew 25 in the context of the Lord Jesus returning to the nation of Israel, to this earth to establish his kingdom, we see an amazing contrast to what Paul said in Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. And that's found in Matthew 25, 31. And in Matthew 25, 31, Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he doesn't refer to the church coming with him in glory, because that's still a secret. If you want to just put in your notes, you who study your Bibles, when it says, when he comes in his glory, just put in your notes, Colossians 3, 1 through 4, it says, whenever Christ, who is the life of his church, the life of his church, whenever he is manifested, revealed, we shall be revealed with him in the glory. That's secret here. Or 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, speaking of this same event, the second advent, he will come to be glorified in his saints. That's the church. He comes in his church to be glorified in them, and then all the world will marvel at him in his church. That's Second Thessalonians one ten. Okay? That's not revealed here. So when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. That's a literal throne 
That's the throne of David that is promised in Amos 9, many other passages. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right. That would be the redeemed of all the ages. Not the church. Not the church. The church comes with him. This is a judgment at the end of the tribulation. When he's manifested for the church, our judgment is distinct and separate and prior to this. 2 Corinthians 5.10 But he says, notice, he says, put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom, notice what it says, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, is there a difference between from the foundation of the world and before? So the Jews and all that which represents the revelation up to this time, they were anticipating a kingdom to be brought to them, prepared for them from the foundation of the world. But when Jesus came to this earth to be the Savior of the world, and as Israel's Messiah, they rejected him. When he came into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, there is a statement made that if the Jews had only understood who Jesus was, that it was this time of visitation, they would not have crucified Jesus Christ. They did not recognize the time of the visitation. And so, as a result, there's only judgment to that nation. All right, so when, as a nation, they rejected the Messiah, Luke 19, verse 41 and following, if you had only known the time of visitation, they did not recognize the time of visitation. On that very day, 483 years of prophetic time frame in Daniel was fulfilled on that Palm Sunday. At that moment, the prophetic clock stopped. And it's like the heavens are going to wait to see what Israel is going to do. That's on Palm Sunday. On that Thursday evening, I believe, was where they crucified him. So he's in the grave three nights. They crucified Messiah. The prophetic clock as it relates to Israel has been stopped since Palm Sunday. Now that prophetic clock will not start again in terms of the seven-year period until a covenant is made with Antichrist. So between Palm Sunday and a firm covenant that will be made with the Jewish people and the Antichrist, Daniel chapter 9, verses, I think, 24 through 27 there, between that period of time is a prophetic parenthesis. In that prophetic parenthesis, God unfolds his plan, going back to Ephesians, which originated with himself in eternity past, before the foundation of the world. Now, in this predetermined purpose and plan of God, God unveiled this to Paul when he was in prison. And in Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3, we see a number of the features of what makes up this plan. He refers to this in chapter 1, verse 9, when he says, when God lavished upon us all the riches of his grace... He says in verse 7 and 8, and then chapter 1, verse 9 of Ephesians, God made known to us the mystery of his will, the sacred secret of his will, which reaches into eternity past, before the creation of the world, verse 4. And it's according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. And that word purpose means predetermined purpose. It's with a view to the administration, that is, the dispensation, suitable to the fullness of times, that is, summing up and reuniting all things in Messiah, things in heaven, things on earth. And he says, in him, we also, literally, have been made an inheritance. So each one of these statements is so loaded, he uses the word inheritance, all that that means, it goes way beyond just salvation. He talks about our inheritance in Christ, verse 14, the Holy Spirit has come so we can enter into that possession. All of this would take several hours to develop. He prays that the spirit of wisdom and revelation be given to his people, verse 17, so that we would know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, verse 18. You ask the average believer, what does that mean when Paul talks about the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Who can sit down and write a one-page summary of what that is? You'd be surprised on how many blank stares you'll get. Why don't we know? Because we have been dumbed down. 
This revelation that God gave Paul was the source of great conflict. It was the source of great battle. And by 96 AD, 30 years later, Jesus is writing to the churches in Asia, which was the major center where Paul worked. And what church does he write to first? Ephesus. They left first love. And in Ephesians, how is first love defined? First love in Ephesians is defined as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify her by the washing of the water of the word. There's first love and first works. It's not just personal. If we have first love, we love what Christ loves first, and that's his church. And so the whole revelation of the church that we're talking about already by John's day had been eclipsed. And so 30 years later, the church at Ephesus was still a fundamental Orthodox Bible church. And yet Jesus says, if you do not repent, I'm going to remove the candlestick from you. They had left first love and first works. So where does that leave us today? And so this gradual recovery of this revelation of the mystery didn't even begin. It had already been eclipsed by 96 A.D. And then for the next 11, 1,200 years, it went into the darkness. So the Dark Ages is really defined because you have the Roman Catholic Church coming to a place of ascendancy where you have the marriage between the church and the state, and the kingdom of God is here on earth administered through a vicar. It's just apostasy, the infallibility of the Pope. Let's do a history and find out how many different papal bulls came forth in contradiction, and they were anything but perfect. We have the Dark Ages, and it wasn't until the Reformation that we have the beginning of the recovery of the original apostolic faith. And the first aspect of that recovery is justification by faith alone in Christ alone. The recovery of the privacy of the priesthood. But did you know what? The whole understanding of eschatology was still under the influence of the Roman Catholic system, which was the church has replaced Israel. That was the belief of Calvin and Luther. And so it wasn't until God raising up of John Nelson Darby that they began to see the distinction between Israel and the church, like we saw in 1 Corinthians 10.32, and that God's plan for Israel and the church is distinct. In fact, if anyone goes online, you can go to STEM Publishing, and they have all the writings of the brethren back in the last century. And if you look on the second coming of Christ, you can see tremendous articles where this recovery was in process of taking place. Okay? So what we were talking about in Ephesians was something that Paul had received, and we're just going on looking at some of these features. One of the features of this mystery is that this new race, this new creation entity, is one new man of Ephesians 2.15. It's one, it's not new mankind, it's not a, a whole bunch of new believers, but all believers, members of that body, are one new man. And how is that defined? Ephesians 1.22, Jesus Christ is head over the church, which is his body, notice, the fullness of him. The church, which is his body, the fullness of him. Now when we look at Colossians 1.19, it says it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to be at home in Christ. In Colossians 2.9, it says that in him, Jesus Christ, all the fullness of deity, the Godhead, dwells in bodily form. So, in Messiah, all the fullness of God, and yet the mystery is, in Ephesians, that the body is to be the fullness of him. Which simply means head and body together in the ages to come, will be the display of the fullness of God. And so this mystery was kept secret until it was patently obvious that Israel as a nation had rejected their Messiah, and then, of course, by 70 A.D., this was a done deal. That happened. And by that time, we see the progressive unfolding of the mystery, as we see in some statements in Romans and Galatians and Colossians. Okay? So Paul goes to prison, and now he is writing that which is the revelation of this secret that has been in the heart of God, but was not revealed until the nation of Israel, through the hardness of their heart, had been temporarily set aside. Romans 9-11 through makes it very clear that it's temporary. When? Until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Then all Israel will be saved. 
Now, just to notice what Paul says in prison, when he is writing to the Ephesians, he says to them in Ephesians 6, verse 18, this is all in connection with the church must put on that whole armor of God, which is a whole other matter of an amazing fleshing out of that prophecy in Isaiah 59, Jesus coming back in full armor in Isaiah 59 to Israel, and that full armor will be his church, raptured or resurrected and in union with him and glorified with him. That's all part of that revelation that God gave to Paul. That's the context. And so he says in Ephesians 6.18, he says, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, that is, being filled with God's Spirit so that you have the mind of Christ, with this in view, to be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And notice this. From prison, he has a request. Pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness, that is, with openness and freedom of speech, the mystery of the gospel. People think gospel just means put your faith in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. That's not what he's talking about. That's not the mystery of the gospel. The mystery of the gospel includes that, but the gospel, salvation through the blood of Christ, is referred to as the gospel of God. In other words, it defines the person and work of Jesus Christ as our Savior through his work on the cross. That's Romans 1, verses 1 through 6, where he refers to Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called an apostle set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. That is the Old Testament. So the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, talks about the gospel, the gospel of God. How do we get saved? There's salvation, Acts 4.12. Peter says, Neither is there salvation in anyone else. There is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. That's the gospel. But the mystery of the gospel includes that, but goes beyond that. It encompasses that whole eternal purpose of God that Paul refers to in Ephesians 3, 1 through 11, which we will need to return to. Well, let's look at Ephesians 3 and verse 8. And we'll go back to Ephesians 6 in a moment. Paul says in Ephesians 3, verse 8, To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given, that is, to be a minister of the plan of God for this age, to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. Now, the unfathomable riches of Christ, that takes us into the mystery of the gospel. And he says, to bring to light, and some manuscripts say, to illumine all the Gentiles as to what is the administration, the economy, that which defines this whole age from Pentecost to Jesus coming for his church. What is the administration? That is the unique plan of God for the time in which we live. Of the mystery. The sacred secret which for ages has been hidden in God. Again, Ephesians 3, nine, Who created all things in order that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church. To who? Israel and the nations? No, not first and foremost but to rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This plan, which reaches back before the creation of the universe, before the creation of Lucifer and the fall of angels, this was in accordance with, notice what he says, the eternal purpose. Or as the Greek says, the purpose of the ages. Wow! The purpose of the ages. That which transcends all of history and yet defines all of history. The purpose of the ages, which God accomplished Eris tense in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that's the mystery, you see. Again, going back to Ephesians 6.19, he's in prison. He says, I'm a prisoner, not of Caesar, but I'm a prisoner of Christ. He says, pray for me that I might make known with boldness, Ephesians 6.19, the mystery of the gospel. Well, it's not difficult to just proclaim that Jesus went to the cross, that on that cross he died for your sins, that you could be forgiven. And that when you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you not only receive forgiveness of sins, but God pronounces and declares you righteous. That's not a mystery. That was proclaimed in the Old Testament. But the mystery involves all that, the gospel, the good news that encompasses the whole purpose and plan of God, which includes salvation, but takes us all the way back into eternity past, all the way into eternity future, in defining the purpose of God, Ephesians 3.11. So he says, pray for me that I might make known with boldness the mystery of the good news for which I am an ambassador in chains, 
in the proclaiming of it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. In other words, this is hard to speak. I mean, you're listening to me in a pretty pathetic way in which I'm trying to explain what Paul is praying that others would understand what he is saying. So I'm here struggling, trying to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, and I am laboring, I am struggling, because as Paul understood that this revelation is beyond human comprehension. That's why he says in Ephesians 1.17, I pray that God would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the full knowledge of himself. Because this mystery is the mystery of Christ in union with his body. Head and body. The Christ. 1 Corinthians 12.12. Now if you go to Colossians, what is the mystery of the gospel? In Ephesians 6.19, he refers to this as the mystery of the gospel. What's the definition of the mystery of the gospel? Well, see how he words that when he's writing from the same prison experience to the Colossians. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, he says, Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Notice, this is a complement to Ephesians 6, 19 and 20. Colossians 4, 3, Praying at the same time for us as well, that God may open up to us a door for the word, so that we may speak forth the what? the mystery of the gospel. What is the mystery of the gospel? It's the mystery of Christ. What is the mystery of the Christ? The mystery of the church, head and body, the Christ, for which I have also been in prison, in order that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. So let's recap. For Paul, this whole process began on the road to Damascus, when, as it says in Acts 8, he was ravaging the church of God. He was persecuting the church of God chapter 9, he was persecuting the disciples of the Lord. And yet when the Lord appeared to him, the Lord could have very clearly said, why are you persecuting my church? Why are you persecuting my disciples? He did not say that. When that light flies from heaven, brighter than the sun, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So what is the church? It's me. It's Jesus revealed and being manifested through a many-membered body of the Messiah. This is the heart and essence and core of that which represents the mystery that Paul was proclaiming. And he's praying. He's saying, listen, this is why I'm in prison. Oh yes, I appealed to Caesar and I ended up in Rome because of my appeal, as he spoke before Agrippa in Acts 26. But he says, behind the scenes, I did not understand. That was the human occasion. But God ordained and providentially allowed me to be set aside in prison for four years. And especially it was in the last two years that the heavens were opened, as it were, and God unveiled his heart and revealed his secret, which is that he is preparing a bride for his son. Now, there are a number of metaphors. In other words, this revelation is so great and so immense. Paul understood that no one metaphor or illustration could define the mystery. So one is found in Ephesians 1 verse 5, which says, God predestined us before the foundation of the world, verse 4, he foreordained us to adoption as sons. Now that word adoption as sons is one Greek word, it's huiothesia. And adoption is a ceremony. It is not anything like what we do when we adopt a child who is not a member of the family and then bring them into the family. It's not what he's talking about. An adoption under the Roman culture, it was a ceremony that when a father's son reached the age of majority, that is, when he attained manhood, that is, maturity, then the privileges, the blessings, the inheritance of the father was transferred to the son. And the son was given a robe in this ceremony, a robe of manhood. And that robe of manhood is called by Paul the robe of Christ. He was given a ring where he could transact for the father. All the treasury and wealth of the father was now at the disposal of the son. Okay? Now that will take place when the church is resurrected and then we receive the redemption of the body which is this adoption ceremony, then the church will be displayed to the universe as God's adult son. That is, the many sons being brought to glory. So, notice what it says here. He predestined us to the adoption of the sons through Jesus Christ 
to himself according to the kind of intention as well. By the way, this word adoption occurs five times by Paul in the New Testament, once with reference to Israel and their special rights, and the other times as it relates to the church. Let me just give you the Chinese translation. In the Chinese Bible, they have captured this one word, huiotasia, translated adoption. Here's how the Chinese Bible translates it. God foreordained or marked us out in his plan that we might attain the name of a son through Jesus Christ to himself. Attain the name of a son. I asked an old house church leader in China when I was there, I said, tell me, in your Chinese Bible, we have the word adoption. That doesn't really describe the term very well. I said, would you describe to me again what you understand this term means as it is so well translated in the Chinese Bible? He looked at me, this old Chinese house church leader, his face being radiant and his eyes just glistening and looking off and away. He said, well, it means that God's purpose for us is that that inheritance that was lost in Adam and which Christ the last Adam has gained for us might be transferred to us so that in Christ the royal heir who is heir of all things of Hebrews chapter 1 we might share in the inheritance that God the Father has given to Christ the royal heir and I said you know what I thought I came to China to teach these house church leaders but they in their own language have a grasp of what this means that we have missed entirely now, that's one aspect of the mystery. Then you move on down to the body which is the fullness of him. Verse 23. That's one aspect. Another aspect of understanding the mystery is the one new man of Ephesians 2.15. The entire body of Christ of which Christ is the head is one new species of humanity. If any man be in Christ, Paul says, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And this is just a dilation of that. Well, what's another metaphor? Since this mystery is so great, the breadth, length, depth, and height of this mystery that Paul talks about in chapter 3, verse 18, is also described as the dwelling place of God, the temple. And so Paul, at the end of chapter 2, verse 19, he says, So then you, you Gentiles, are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints, and are God's household. The word household, as I mentioned in a previous time, both in the Greek and the Hebrew, the term household stands by metonymy. It represents family. So the church age believers are God's household. That means we are his royal family. Christ is the king. We are kings in his family. That is, that's God's purpose that we become kings in his household, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, that is, New Testament prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone of this house, that is, he's the foundation we know in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, but as the cornerstone, that's that part of the building that you put in place so that the entire structure as it's being built derives its symmetry, its character, and definition from the cornerstone who is Christ. So everything in this house that God is building, that's just one of the metaphors, must be according to Christ, or otherwise it's wood, hand, stubble. If it's according to Christ as cornerstone, it will be gold, silver, and precious stones. So he's the cornerstone in whom Christ, the cornerstone, the whole building is being fitted together and growing into a holy temple in the Lord. Notice, this building is growing. The word growing is organic. How can a building grow organically? Because the metaphor is bigger than the picture. This is not a physical temple. This is a spiritual building. This living organism that Christ is the head is the dwelling place of God. The permanent dwelling place of God. In other words, the temple in the Old Testament where the Shekinah glory was, that was just a earthly, physical, visible type of that temple of which Christ is head in union with his body would someday foretell. But that was not revealed in the Old Testament. So, this whole building is in the process of being fitted together, one stone being added to another, as Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5, is being fitted together, adapted, and interadapted together. It is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. That word temple means a most holy place. It would be like the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament. In whom, the Lord, you are being 
built together into literally a permanent dwelling of God in the Spirit. Now, you remember earlier I said, chapter 3, verse 1, for this reason. Now, we're back. We're back. Now, we just covered just some of the territory that Paul described in Ephesians 1 and 2. So when he says, for this reason, I just touched on some of those aspects of that revelation that he's talking about. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, assuming indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, that is, that administration of God's plan that he gave to me for you, that by revelation, it was once secret, but God has revealed, he has unveiled it, there was made known to me the mystery. As I wrote before in brief, and by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of the Christ, head and body, one organism, one temple, one new man, the fullness of him who fills all in all, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men. No one knew. They didn't even know it in the Gospels. They didn't even know it at the beginning of the book of Acts when Peter was preaching at Pentecost. That mystery as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. That is, that which God gave to Paul it was then shared, as Second Peter says in chapter 3, it was made known by the Spirit to them. To be specific that the Gentiles, to new birth, being born again, being made members of this new humanity, are fellow heirs. Fellow heirs with who? You know in the NIV, it says fellow heirs with Israel. That's added. There is no Israel there. It's fellow heirs with God in Christ. You have to interpret the Bible by using the Bible. Christ is the heir of God. We are the heirs of God, and we are joint heirs with Christ because he is the heir of God. That's Romans 8, verses 16 and 17, compared with Hebrews chapter 1, verses 3 and following. Christ is the royal heir of God. And so we're joint heirs with the heir, Christ. Fellow heirs with him and fellow members of that body of which he is the head, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. In other words, we are heavenly associates. That fellow partakers takes us back to another reference in in Hebrews 3.14. We are the house of God that we will share in royalty. We are partakers of Christ if we hold fast our confession firm to the end. Well, partakers there means we will share an airship, but we won't share an airship that is, his inheritance, if we don't suffer with him, that we may be glorified with him, Romans eight sixteen and 17. Or if we don't endure with him, we will not reign with him, Second Timothy 2, verse 12. Okay, so that's what this is, what he's talking about here. So, these are real short little terms that need to be broken down. He says that the promise of Christ through the gospel, of which gospel I was made a minister, Ephesians 3, 7, according to the gifts of God's grace which was given to me according to the working of his power. That working is the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead in Ephesians chapter 2 and Ephesians 1. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. We already read this. This is all in accordance, verse 11, with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ, in whom we have boldness and confident access to faith in him. So, just to sum up, Peter says in the end of his epistle in Second Peter that what Paul has to say is hard to understand. Now, if Peter says it's difficult for us to understand some of the deep things of God's eternal purpose, then we should be encouraged. If it was difficult for Peter, then it's going to be a challenge to us. And Peter says in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 16, he says, In all Paul's letters, speaking them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. Now, why? Because it's the very heart of God that governs his purpose from everlasting to everlasting. We have to be diligent. Every time we go to the Word, we should hold up to the Lord, Ephesians 1.17. O oh Lord, I pray that you would give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the full knowledge of yourself. Verse 18, that the eyes of my heart would be flooded with light in order that I would know the hope of your calling, as you would have me know it, which originates in you before the foundation of the world. Verse 4, and that you would give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation as to what is the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints. What is that? The riches of the glory of the Father's inheritance in the saints is that Christ be fully formed in each member. That's why Paul says that he's laboring and striving according to God's power to present every man mature in Christ. Colossians chapter 1 verses 28 and 29. Why? 
Because as Christ is being formed in you and me, to the measure in which that formation takes place, God obtains the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Because Christ is God's heir. You see? So all of this is biblical language. But I am aware that anyone listening, you're only able to take in, absorb, in the measure in which you have been perfected in Christ or matured in Christ, Colossians 1.28. So... We live in an environment where there's been so much distraction and so much preoccupation. We can be preoccupied with programs. We can be preoccupied with doing Christian works and not even know this. How preoccupied do you think Paul was in preaching the gospel before he was put in prison? I would say that he was very, very dedicated all through the book of Acts. He went town to town. He was stoned in one place at Lystra. He comes back and he encourages the saints after you've just been stoned there. There's no question about his dedication of preaching the gospel and seeing churches planted throughout the ancient world. We don't question that, do we? Well, then what justified God removing him from such a busy ministry of preaching the gospel and planting churches? He tells us in Ephesians 6, 19 and 20, Colossians 3, 3 and 4, I was put in prison that this vast purpose of God as it relates to Christ and the church might be made known to the Gentiles. And so here we are. What needs to happen to us so that we have an enlarged capacity to hear? Well, now we'll go back and see in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and Galatians, carnality. The wisdom of man, the wisdom of this world, was an obstruction that was a part of the contamination of the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapters 1-4. through four. The very small capacity of the Corinthians was due to their carnality. We see in those chapters, the first four chapters. And then in chapter 5, we see that they were so misusing grace that there was a man who was sleeping with his father's wife. And they were boasting about it. And it was creating leaven in the church. And that leaven needed to be removed. And so Paul has to deal with all these problems. And yet he says in 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 9, there is a wisdom for those who are mature. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 9, but they're not mature. He says that in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4. They're carnal, fleshly babes. What does that mean? They don't have the capacity for him to preach anything else other than Jesus Christ and him crucified. He cannot proclaim the mystery of the gospel to them because they are carnally involved. 1 Corinthians six nineteen. Can you take a member of Christ and join that with a harlot? And that's what some of them are doing. He can't preach the gospel that he received in prison in Rome to the Corinthians because they don't have the capacity because of their carnal, self-centered limitation. And so I say this that to those that may be listening and may feel lost, well, this may not just be a carnality issue that we see in Corinthians. Maybe on the other side, it is a living under the law problem. Like we see that issue coming out more in Second Corinthians in the whole book of Galatians where we see that these believers who were once running well, having begun in the Spirit, are now seeking to be perfected by keeping the works of the law, circumcision, and other things. So the whole book of Galatians is a book to try to bring believers back into the realm of the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 2. Whereas instead of living by the Spirit, they were being wooed by the false teachers coming out of Jerusalem, the false apostles, to bring them back under law. Rules and regulations. If you want to be a, a better Christian, then let me give you this formula. Let's go to another seminar and learn more principles. Well, those may be helpful, but it will never bring us to the reality that Paul taught. God may use it, but it will not bring us there. Now, when Paul is writing to the Galatians, he's seeking to bring them back into the place where they can even begin to understand these things. And so, some are saying, yeah, you can believe what Paul's preaching, but you need to be circumcised too. You need to be a uh, part of God's covenant through obeying these Jewish rules. Paul says in Galatians 6.15, For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. The new creation, of which he fully defines in Ephesians and Colossians, he just alludes to here. They can't hear it because they're living under legalism. They think of Christ plus something. Christ plus doing this keeping this group of laws or Christ plus I've got to abstain from this and that and the other. I'm not talking about sin, but I'm just talking about whatever it is, whatever your rules are. And so I would just perhaps maybe leave it at this, and probably is enough. Maybe we can begin to look and go back away from the mountaintop, if you will, 
and look at some of the steps that God has to bring us there, but then we need to get back into that framework of what were the very first messages that Paul preached to the churches around the coming of the Lord for the church. And so having given something of the uniqueness of that revelation, the message that God gave to the church, then perhaps the next time we could go into Thessalonians, which has to do with the Lord coming for his church, then Second Thessalonians, which has to do with a follow-up epistle that Paul wrote, because there were some claiming to be apostles and to be inspired who were saying to Christians that because you are suffering, you're in the day of the Lord. In other words, you're in the tribulation. He had the right to correct that. And so by looking and comparing First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians, we can begin to see more and more of the uniqueness of God's call for the church. But a part of that uniqueness is the mystery of the church being what is called rapture. And that is, of course, found in 1 Corinthians 15. We have, Behold, I show you a mystery. In 1 Corinthians, we shall not all sleep, but we shall put on immortality. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 and following. So we'll need to look at why does Paul refer to the resurrection of the church a mystery? Because in the Old Testament, the resurrection was not a mystery. We know that, according to Peter, that Christ coming as Savior and to be the sin bearer was foreknown. And so in the purpose and plan of God, his first plan is that many sons will be brought to glory. That's his first plan. But because of man's fall and God knowing that, he had to also incorporate into this plan the means of redemption so that through redemption, man might be brought back into that line of purpose which is God's first thought, and that is to bring many sons to glory. So because of man's fall, which results in both spiritual death and physical death, that would require resurrection. Resurrection is a resurrection from the dead, and death came in because of sin. And so resurrection is the only way God can restore man to that which represents his original purpose that was in his heart and mind before the creation of the world. Father, we do just hold up to you these last two sessions. You know, Father, that apart from a spirit of wisdom and revelation being given to your people, that they're just words, and it is a stretch. So, Father, I pray for everyone who will listen to this. In the future, I ask you, Father, in Jesus' name, you grant them a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the full knowledge of yourself, that the eyes of heart would be light, that they would know the very things that Paul talked about there that we've mentioned in Ephesians chapter 1. So, in your grace and mercy, grant your people that revelation of the fullness of your eternal purpose that you brought forth through our brother Paul to make known to us and that would govern our thoughts and govern our next understanding that we need to receive of what is the blessed hope for the church. We pray in Jesus' name. Jesus